Hello and welcome to Scandinavia House at tonight's book talk with Paul Larkin and Martin Hoy Jensen on Martin E. Hansen's The Liar, uh, one of the greatest works of modern Scandinavian fiction. The book is out now by NYRB Classics and you can purchase it over there um, or yeah, purchase it over there. It helps support literary events at Scandinavia House. Um, is, is, is it, it is in a new translation by Paul and with an introduction by Morton. Uh, Scandinavia House hosts uh, programs throughout the year, both in-house and virtually. They include concerts, film screenings, lectures, literary events, and children's programming. So please do visit Scandinavia.org for everything that we have on to offer. Paul Larkin is a journalist, filmmaker, critic, and translator from the Danish and other Nordic languages. He is a winner of the European Journalist of the Year Award in 1997 and 2008. He was awarded the Best International Director Prize at the New York Independent Film and Video Festival. Morten Hoyensen is a writer and critic from Copenhagen, and he's the author of A Difficult Death, The Life of the Work of Jens Peter Jakobsen. So please do welcome Paul and Morten. This is a bit of a special night because uh, Paul and I actually started corresponding 13 years ago, um, but we only finally met in person last night. Um, so it's something we've been looking forward to for a very long time. Uh, we originally started corresponding about, it was about Pontabidan, right? Um, Paul has previously translated uh, probably the, the biggest, the great Danish novel, uh, Lugapir, or A uh, Fortunate Man, in, in Paul's translation, uh, which came out in English for the first time a couple years ago, and which is being published again by, in your translation, by New York Review Books Classics in the future. Um, am I forgetting anything? That's right? No, no yeah. that's correct, yeah. Um, Lugapir, A Fortunate Man, um, Luga is not luck. Luga is fortune, or it's much more expansive concept than just luck. So, yes, um, A Fortunate Man was the first, if you like, um, interaction between myself and Martin. And I think that he takes, Martin takes literature very, very seriously, <laughs> and uh, as do I. But we also have fun and um, think that, uh, you know, that you need a bit of generosity as well. And by the way, um, I want to present. Martin with a leprechaun. <laughs> I brought the New York Books, New View Books team uh, to show my great esteem with, speaking of fortune, um, with a leprechaun. And a leprechaun, by the way, the old word in Old Celtic um, is Lou Carpine. Lou is the old, I think it's a proto Indo European word, as we were talking about in a Sanskrit and Indo European is the old word for small, and carpon is carp, body, carpon, lou carpon, and somehow that became leprechaun. And um, they, did, they do really exist. Probably they existed, they exist on Sand Island too, if when our hero, our anti-hero, Johannes Lai, don't say that name too fast, is he sly, is he a liar? Johannes Svi, um, maybe he'll find the leprechauns too. So we're in that world, that world, that exploration of those things here. So there's more mysticism in the Danes and amongst Danes than you actually, than they're actually willing to admit, I think. And that book, this great book actually demonstrates that. And by the way, I'm sucking lozenges here because Martin Hansen and Jon Sly played a trick on me today and threw some frogs in my, uh, my voice box. So forgive me for uh, the kind of croaking that I'm coming out with now. Well, first of all, thank you for the leprechaun. I'm sending you, sending you a bottle of Akhavit as, as a sure thank you. Make sure you look after him. Um, I'm going to start by reading just the Danish, uh, a, a page and a half of the, the original Danish edition of uh, The Liar of Loiran, and then Paul will read his, uh, his translation. 13. marts, det er toget. Nathaniel, jeg har fået lyst til at fortælle dig noget. Lidt løst og, lidt løst og fast. Eller jeg har bare brug for en at tale lidt med. Meget har jeg jo ikke at fortælle. Det er 13. marts, Nathaniel og fredag. Chapter 1. The 13th of March. We have fog. Nathan, I suddenly feel the need to tell you something. Or perhaps I just need someone to talk to. Don't worry. It's not like I have much to tell. It's the 13th of March, Nathan. It's Friday. Very heavy fog out there. We've had fog before while the pack ice is laying about the island. 
but not this mild, wet fog, Nathan. I was up early this morning before daybreak and saw that the fog had set in once over the island um, during the night. The bark in the line of Spruce Street at the end of my garden is turning black with it, though right now I can barely see it, make them out. Has spring actually arrived? I mean, in all seriousness? Knock on wood. If this really is spring, I'm afraid there'll be a few troubled hearts here on Sand Island, Nathan. No shortage of hearts here. There are tens of the dozen, a real flock of hearts. So, Paul, why did you, why is it that you translate not, that you translate from the Danish? Oh, um, God, God, oh, God. Have we got 10 hours for this? <laughs> um, I was, uh, I don't know if you guys believe in providence, in angels, anyone? Angels are, yeah, me too. Well, I'm Irish, so I have to, but I think Herman Melville called it the, what did he call it, the pattern in the carpet? That in a way, things always turn out. Um, I think he got that from Emerson, actually. I'm not sure it's from someone, anyone who knows Emerson better than I do and Toro better than I do. But here I was, I first read Line and when I was 18 years of age in the Danish Merchant Navy. And the Danes are so, such cultured people, they have this system called Jakob Huske, they say that. Les or let go of either. Um, what would you say there? Read it and let it sit. Read it. Yeah, pass it on. Sumen in his bibliotheque, there's the Siemens. I'm great at translating books, but I'm, other things I'm not great. Um, but so basically, there I was in the Danish Merchant Navy reading this, The Liar. And now here I am in New York. Holy God, with all these great people that served here and Martin having nursed me through this fantastic edition of this book. So that, I've one rule about coincidences. I've one uh, kind of statement about coincidences, and there's no such thing as coincidences, okay? So why am I here? And what happened was that essentially, when I joined the Danish Merchant Navy, um, the Sumen's Forbund, the Sailors Union had a rule that if you go into a dangerous country or countries um, which were where both ships were under attack, the sailors could refuse to join. So there was my poor Danish sea captain looking for us. Keeps me saying he was looking for a crew, and I, so I became the what they call the caboose time. The you know a caboose is a kitchen. So it's the same story really as say Jack London. He was a caboose boy, as well. And it's quite remarkable really that I read this book. Holy God, I was just transfixed by this book, but not in the way that I was subsequently when I went into the actual, if you like, the matrix of the book. But we sailed, to, to, to finish that story, we were sailing to Lagos. Danish ships were being attacked at that time. And so as we were heading down to Lagos, we were meeting Scandinavian ships that had just after being attacked in Lagos. And the problem was that they'd invaded by Afro, as we know, discovered oil and began to order building materials, but they didn't build the keys for the ships. So there were a flotilla of ships outside Lagos, sitting ducks for six months. So what I, th I believe our company paid a bribe and we got in and uh, within three days. So that was the first time I read uh, Lining and the Liar, and I've read it so many times since. Still with the same, still has the same magic for me. I read it in school which is a lot less exciting than, than Paul's story. Martine Henson was born um, on, on Stounts, um, a, a peninsula some, a while south of Copenhagen that sort of resembles, the nature kind of resembles uh, this fictional island, Sent Island or Senu, um, that, um, where, where this novel takes place. And he lived a fairly quiet life. He studied in the seminary. Uh, he was a school teacher for many years. Um, and he lived a sort of outwardly fairly undramatic life. Um, the most dramatic thing that happened to him, which happened to all Danes back then, was uh, the German occupation of Denmark, which lasted from 1940 to 1945. Um, and towards the end of those uh, of that occupation, uh, Martine Hansen was involved with the Danish resistance movement. Um, and he was the editor of a uh, resistance newspaper called Folk of Frihed, Folk and Freedom. Um, and 
he wrote an essay in the form of a Socratic uh, dialogue uh, in which he justified the assassination of what we call stiga, which were basically Danish informers who informed um, on uh, informed to the Nazis about the whereabouts or actions of the Danish resistance fighters. So these were some of the most hated Danes. And towards the end of the war, uh, hundreds of them were assassinated, often shot in the back. Um, and um, Martin A. Henson wrote this, wrote this uh, essay in which he justified these assassinations. And he didn't quite uh, live to regret writing it, but it gave him moral qualms over the years. Uh, because around the time that he wrote it, the, uh, the number of ass assassinations increased uh, quite a lot. Um, now, it's not entirely relevant to The Liar, and the war doesn't figure really in The Liar. It's referenced one or, once or twice. Um, but I think it, it's very much a novel that where you can feel uh, the, um, the, the, the sort of moral um, wasteland that the war left behind. And this, the, the search for meaning is, and the search for an existential standpoint uh, is an important part of this novel. Anything I'm leaving out about Henson that you want to add? Yeah, I do. I think, though, that um, I think there was a general feeling of George Steiner, for example, wrote um, extensively about, I suppose, the end of culture after the Holocaust can we actually create anything after the Holocaust? And so, um, really, that was the crisis. We had the crisis of modernism and the language. What can language do? And then we had, how do we deal with this, um, with this catastrophe that happened? And then the human stories, as, as Martin has said, of people who were involved in the war, and we meet them in the pages of, of uh, Leinland, of The Liar. So, yes, it, that crisis is there, and it does inform this... Um, Writers, this, he is a writer, in fact, Johannes Lai, who keeps a notebook. But we find, as we go along, that actually, are we able to um, believe this notebook? Can do, is he actually telling us the truth? And the, the, the idea of the notebook, of course, comes from Kierkegaard. And he kept a profuse amount of journals and wrote, wrote extensively. He was a gra he grapholmer, grapholmermanic, really, I suppose you could say. But that idea of the journal, and I think there was an Italian book that came out recently in, um, in, in translation in English, where the journal that was kept secretly was described as a bomb in a biscuit tin, because the secrets in this book were so explosive that, you know, they, this lady, uh, this wife, this mother described the children, and, and not always in, in the most um, glowing tones. So, Keeping of journals and the keeping of, of um, records is, is, a, is a dangerous thing too, and we find with, without giving too much away that um, that's the crisis of this man, this who's also a, a, some kind of spiritual leader on the island, or is, is meant to be his crisis um, about how, how he can get back, he can find a way back to some kind of reconciliation and redemption. By the way, isn't one of the things about this really, really brilliant novel is that he's actually quite a horrible person. Often in these stories, you get, you know, the beginning, the middle, and the end, and by the end, oh, they're all great. You know, you get this um, riding off into the sunset. Again, without giving too much away, that doesn't happen in this book. But there, there are some very, very interesting developments. And I think that it challenges us, all of us, and I'm going, I'm going on at length here. But there's one thing, other thing I want to say, which comes from the very start, which, which we're just after reading which is that we all speak to ourselves. Is there anyone here who thinks that they don't speak to themselves? You all speak to yourself all the time. I do, you do. So what then? You, what do you talk to, what do you talk to yourself about? What is it? So you're asking these questions about yourself. Well, why did I do that? Or um, why, why am I doing this so big? Kierkegaard said, everybody, everybody has to have Worldview, a way of looking yeah. at the world. Yeah. Worldview, Weltanschauung in, in, in German. So that's really the context of this book. And that's another important thing to say about the book is that it originally was um, a serial on the radio. Uh, so in 1950, uh, was it January 1950? Something yeah, like that. Yeah. Uh, it was read um, uh, over a series of evenings by a Danish actor. Um, and 
Paul just told me before, which what I didn't know, that uh, Martin e. Hansen was actually still writing it while it was being read on the air. Mm. Um, so, which I, I mean, it, it's such a beautifully composed book uh, that it does it doesn't it doesn't read as if it was written in haste at all. Yeah, well, um, some some things are, are best written under under pressure, and then uh, you know, Martin A. Hansen was a very ex um, you could say a very, very, int it certainly was a very, very intense person. And actually, by the way, he fell off a tree. He was a, what they call a chainist to Carl. Um, uh, uh, what we did just, we say just, that was? Uh, to Carl. Farmhand. Um, farmhand, yeah. yeah. He fell off a tree, and from that day onwards, when he was a, a farmhand, he came from a poor background, he had massive, massive headaches after that. And Kierkegaard fell off a tree as well. And he always blamed that for this hump. Um, so, it's strange that those two, these two people were so wedded together in many, many ways because he's very much informed by Kierkegaard and that idea of talking to ourselves and, and self-reflection. And, you know, even the, the language system in Danish the, is even more extensive than the Danish, uh, the German reflexive. So that's another issue. And they both died almost the same age. Yeah. Uh, Martin Hansen right, died too. when he was 46, very tragically, of kidney failure. Yeah. Um, do you know why he died of kidney failure? He, it was his addiction to yeah, uh, the, uh, pills, right? Yeah, the pain, the painkiller uh, and other things as well. And he accidentally, when he was at uh, an hospital in Sweden, he took um, a very, very severe kind of, I think, I'm not a, a scientist, so, but it's very bad for his liver. So he was a very intense person, um, and he produced a plethora of short stories as well when, on the, during the time as we Irish people say when he was on the run. Um, lots of Irish people have been on the run. So uh, for various reasons, which we won't go into, and enjoying the occupation, he, he too went underground and remarkably produced some of his greatest works. So the, the novel is, it's set over uh, four days. It begin, opens on Friday, March 13th, and it concludes, well, we won't say where it concludes, but um, it's written, as, as Paulus mentioned, uh, as a series of diary-like entries to a fictional addressee called, uh, in Danish, Nathaniel, but Nathan, um, named after a biblical character who was said to be incapable of deceit. Um, and it's, of course, it's written, as we mentioned, for the radio, uh, so it's sort of meant to be to be spoken in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also very eccentric. Uh, the prose is quite eccentric, and it's filled with allusions to uh, Danish poetry, Norse, myth uh, Norse mythology, the Bible, um, and it cannot have been easy to translate. So, what, what, when did you when did you first work on this translation? Well, and when did I it think it had to be an Irish one who translated New English, to be honest, um, because we still believe in God. Um, or, or rather, at the very least... This is why not. I didn't translate it. <laughs> well, if you don't have that basic... Even Pontopidan, he, he never left the, the, um, the uh, Lutheran church officially. I, I believe at that time you actually had to declare that you were leaving. Is that correct? I'm not sure. But anyway, um, certainly within Martin A. Hansen's time, um, what he said was uh, an important book for him was Kierkegaard's Sickness Unto Death. And the death is not... The, the physical death, it's your death that you're you flight from religion. And it's, he's not really saying religion, with, you know, in some kind of organized way, because as we know, he rejected hierarchies and so on. But your flight from yourself, what are you doing with your life? It's like, you know, sopranos, what are you going to do? You know, it's, it's, what are you doing? And the crisis of your possibilities when you're talking to yourself, which is the basis of sin, as far as Kierkegaard's concerned, and his concern as well is, what am I going to do? What is this horrible person in many ways going to do? How is he going to reconcile himself with himself and then reach out to others? So that's a crisis that he's going through. I quite like you, Hennis. Um, <laughs> but maybe that says more about me than, than, than about him. Um, so he, he, he's one of the sort of great unreliable narrators in, in modern fiction. And one of, the funny, one of the fun things about reading this novel is trying to puzzle out what is and what isn't true. Mm. Um, and um, I mean, Johannes, anyone who knows their, their Kierkegaard will know that, um, you know, he's probably named after one of, or well, after Kierkegaard's uh, famous seducer. Um, and you were talking, we were talking earlier in a cafe about Socratic irony. 
Um, yeah, and right. Martin A. Hansen was a very, very careful reader of Kierkegaard. Um, and I wonder if you could say a little bit about the role that irony plays in the narrative of this novel. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, obviously early on. I can't, I don't have ancient Greek, but it's this idea that you know, you know more than the other person, but you hide your, your knowledge to say, oh, really? Tell me more. And so the E just begins to talk beyond himself. And then she say, over oh, well, Elisai. And going on and clearly, clearly revealing that he doesn't know. So when we meet these um, people who, and Johannes himself, when he's writing his diary, we find that he's actually, we do discover that there are nasty aspects to his life, nasty aspects to his past. So we have to try and work out. But at the end of the, this novel, like Betcher, you will be asking questions of yourselves. Well, what do you think about that? Because that's the essential point of Socratic irony. When, if you read the Greek texts, I've only read them in translation, they all say that cause Socrates drives me mad because he's, uh, he's, he puts bees in my head and I can't I have to try and think about myself. So that's how uh, irony lifts, this, this Socratic dialogue lifts you beyond yourself to begin to question yourself. So that's really the point of Socratic irony. I guess we should say a little bit more about Johannes. So he is, he's approaching 40. Um, and as he repeatedly says, he's, he's balding. Um, and he is sort of a, he performs a lot of tasks on this fictional island. He is the postmaster, he's a, he's a, a parish clerk, he's a schoolmaster, and he is, he's sort of involved in, all, in, in the, all the islands, everyone's business in some way, and yet he lives at a remove from practically everyone around him. Uh, he lives alone with his dog, uh, he spends most of his time either hunting or writing in his notebooks or drinking too much cognac. Um, and, um, and, you know, but he, he, but he does his main interaction really within that is when is within the people who are not, if you're like literate, you know. Yes. You, you know, do you agree? I agree, yeah. So, one, one very, very moving interaction that he has is with a very poor couple whose son uh, has tuberculosis and, um, and he. You know, he, he basically convinces them to to send him to the mainland so he can go to a sanatorium. Yeah, that's a very very sad story. But I think if you look at the the people, Olaf's mother, for example, with again without giving too much away, these people who are actually so solid, and they actually believe in the passage of the seasons. They're not superficial in any way. In that sense, they're not well read, but they know when the snipe is going to come to the island. They know about sin. They know about the the passage of time, and they remember their their past, their past family, the people who have passed on, and so on. So, in that sense, they are rock solid. And I feel, anyway, maybe you know, people we were talking before about the different reception that readers give. You you may feel that you want to explore other things, but I think he, what he's revealing is that really what's solid about this place, what I can grab hold of, is the land. The question of um, of um, the passage of the seasons, because that's absolutely sure that these things are happening. When, when he went on to write Ormature, which I would translate as uh, the serpent and the bull, um, Martin Hansen, Martin A. Hansen, described the way the churches were built in Denmark and in Scandinavia generally were built on the old sites of old passage graves and old, old monuments. So there, there was a link for him in this, trying to find some kind of solidity in a world of confusion. Question for you, Paul. There, there are a lot of birds in this in this novel. Um, where is Jonathan Friends and when you need him? Um, but did you know? Were you familiar with all these birds? Because I had to look every one of them up to. Well, that there, there is a lot of. I, I was actually, but there is a lot of research to be done. And um, you know, I, I, I did a degree in in Scandinavian and Celtic studies. So you do you do have occasion to go through these uh, in London and UCL, by the way. You do have a really occasion, a very, very, to fine tune your knowledge of the, the different languages, going back to Old Norse as well, obviously. So that really, really does help. So you do need to answer your previous question about how you translate a thing like this, which is so many layers that you need actually to have that basis of, um, of uh, a cultural understanding. But from the outside, I, I was in a very, very strange position because I learned Danish as a child as a sponge, and actually I have a problem with numbers and things like that, um, but with languages, they just, they just seem to sink in. And um, when, you know, when you have that 
essential knowledge of a, a, the core of a language and then standing outside it at the same time, you also get a very good view of, uh, of the meta language, if you like. So I think that, that answers your question. That you do need a really, really solid basis um, within the Danish culture and language to be able to translate a book like that. How long did it take you to translate this book? Um, it didn't take that long, actually. It's a short book. Um, it took me seven years to translate A Fortunate Man. Holy God, seven years of, of my life, and I'm no spring chicken. So this took me, I think it took me nine months after taking the original notes. But I'd been taking notes since since I was a boy, really. I, I, I kind of, it's a, in a way, it's going into the matrix, and I kind of know that I'm in there. You do understand that? Whereas with other books, I wouldn't be able to do that. I think maybe this is a controversial thing to say. I, I would probably be crap at certain other books, you know. Whereas my friend Martin Macon, he 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 goes into modern fiction and so on. And I've just translated Peter Seberg, by the way, for with Herbert at the seaside. But normally I go for classic texts. And I, I don't know if any of you people in the audience are translators, but I, I, there's certainly books that I wouldn't approach. But classics and that depth, then I'm at home. How do you approach, I mean, so Le Guppier, or a fortunate man, is, um, it, it was published, I think, serially in 1904, but it, but it's very much sort of a, a 19th century novel and has the, the you know, the, the length and the breadth and the, all the, the kind of sensibilities of a 19th century novel. This is very different, not just in its, in the way that it's written, but in the voice, I mean, this being primarily a voice novel. So how, do you, how, do, how is it to turn from translating that to translating something like this? I met Klaus Griefberg, God rest his soul, just before he died. He was actually, it was just a few months before he died. And we sat talking for an hour about um, the word mellifluous and the fact that it was hilarious, the, the fact that Irish people have this, um, we call it leaf. I was speaking Irish to my wife before, by the way. Um, we, we live in a native Irish-speaking place. So we have this facility with language, which you probably noticed. Um, we could talk the hind leg off a donkey, as we say. And so when, when you have that kind of fluency with languages, I think, I think that really, really helps. You know, a, so when I talked to Klaus about translating his novel thing, Cornish Uschgul, which was very, very difficult um, in terms of managing that new language, when you have already have as an Irish person, I'm not going on about an Irish person, but I do think because we have these two languages, Irish and English, which is why James Joyce wrote, could write Ulysses, if anyone's tried that, um, and Finnegan's Wake. You know, then you have, and I think probably all cultures that are bilingual or multilingual, they, those translators would probably likely be more able to tackle something like that, you know? But that's just my theory, I don't know. There are obviously different schools of thought and approaches to, to translation. Um, can you say something about your approach to it? I mean, do you, are you, you know, sort of going slavishly after complete fidelity or do you think there are more creative licenses? I think, I think it's a, a question of both, but you know, um, I'm sure you've all seen Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and all the orcs running around and the whole, the whole thing. Um, that, not many people know that that goes back to the Sigurd myth, to the, the original ring myth, and that although Gunnar, who is one of the heroes of that Volsung family saga, which you all should read, it's amazing, um, he, he turns out to be a bad guy, but he's kind of tricked and he kills, helps to kill his brother-in-law and so on. That always, murders always happen in these sagas, but when Gunnar is presented with a fake heart, and I'm getting to the point about translation, which is supposed to be his brother when he's in the snake pit, they present the heart to him, and he says, that's not my brother. My brother's heart will be beating proudly still, even though it's dead. John Berger, who was one of my great um, mentors, said that language is nothing to do with words. It's what you do is you go in and you find the actual beating, Gunnar's beating heart of that text. And then when you actually have that beating heart in your hand, then when you feel the beat of that and the really the music of it, then then you can transpose that into the new language if you're lucky. And I, I've tried some books and they haven't worked, but with those particular books, 
project manning for a school school line on I actually think I have succeeded so it's that and there's no way you could teach that you know how I, people have asked me how did you about that particular thing and that it's a, it sounds really airy fairy doesn't it? well geez the beaten heart all right but I don't know but once you feel that you have that and you you feel that you can move with that and you're not really translating anymore it's kind of like a musical score I don't have a musical note in my head but I have a a lexical mu note in lexical notes in my head you I mean you've certainly captured I think that the beating heart of of um or a certain kind of Danish culture. And you, I was thinking this, you, you know, you, you, you posted on Twitter today a piece that you wrote for the Irish Times last year, right? Um, when was it? Uh, where are we now? Yes, it was last year, yeah. And in which, which uh, he, Paul begins by, uh, you know, describing what people normally think of as being quintessentially Danish, you know, hygge and sitting inside by a fireplace and, you know, this sort of, Danish which has pastries. kind of become like, yeah, Danish pastries, it's become this sort of uh, lifestyle now. Um, but then he Wiener says, <laughs> eating Wiener Um But then you say that it's actually not very true and that Danes are, are anti Hugo. Yeah, uh, I, I think, I mean, I sailed with a lot of guys from Uland, and if you've ever met people from Uland, Jutland, they are the most cussed people. And, you know, where I live in, in Donegal, in an island, um, they're the kind of similar kind of people who, um, if you read Jonas V. Jensen, for example, and Kongsfeld, there's absolutely no way you can come around things and say, hey, Danes are a really nice crowd of, crowd of people. So we ha they have this strange um, conflict between, I think, uh, externally a very, very um, affable, and they have this Roligan thing, but they're not hooligans, they're Roligans, which is great. And they really are peaceful, decent people, but internally there's turmoil going on in there, and they still have that kind of sense, especially in certain areas in the country, of cussedness. And um, great, great. I suppose the thing about that I think about Danish people is goes back to the sagas again, and um, the the word that's gone into English of Holmgang. Anyone know what Holmgang means? Listen to this, lads. If you know the law, you can challenge the greatest chieftain because you have the right. You have the right to even to the point of going out onto a small islet and fighting the chieftain to death by Holmgang, you have the right to speak. And that individuality is a, an extremely um, important part, in my view, of the Danish psyche, but it's not something that um, is really stressed or known about. But, uh, you know, that, that individuality and the stress, and it's still there today, that you can be who you want to be is a very, very important part of that and it's an important part of this book, book as well so that that's my view um, of the danish psyche you know yeah and as you point out in that piece uh there there was there so much darkness in in danish literature and you i remember you mentioned hans christian anderson's uh, skugen the shadow yeah. which is darker than the darkest kafka uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean how do they make out that hans christian anderson is a kind of hugo paste danish pastries <laughs> author I mean, it's crazy. Um, you know, he's, and, and by the way, Kierkegaard was very jealous of Anderson because he was so, he obviously was such a genius. And um, there were two geniuses there. How do they keep producing these geniuses? No one's asked that. That it's this introverted thing. And Niels Bohr, who went, you know, he went in, he was so reflexive, he went inside the atom. His favorite book was Stay the Believers Fight, Stages on Life's Way. Is and, that he, right? and he was an atheist. Yeah. Nils Bohr's favorite book was Stages on Life's Way. Yeah, Stages on Life's Way, yeah. Because of this conflict going two, two ways at once. Do you see what I'm saying? I think that's the Danish, the conflict. God, you know, I mean, no wonder psychotherapy is so popular in, in Denmark, you know, or it used to be anyway. Um, you know, get some self-help, lads. Read, read Leuner and instead, and read Kierkegaard. That would be my advice. But I do think you're, I'm not saying that you're very conflicted people, but you're very, very individualistic. Well, I think we should give you honorary Danish citizenship. Well, I'm Irish, so you, you don't stop being Irish, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I was on the Danish ships, and those men looked after me very, very well in their own rough and ready way. I was a poor boy. I came from a very poor background. Don't start getting the violins out. 
I'm only saying that that's just the truth of it. And they recognised what happened. They looked after me, taught me Danish and explained things. And one of the amazing things was they were there. They're, I mean, these big, tough guys all, you know, checking the liver post die, the, the, what's liver post die? We're here at the thing. Liver pate? Liver, yes. liver pate, yeah, and things like that. And they're standing of the cheeses and smelling the cheeses and teaching me how to cook. So that's how you get culture. That's how you understand a new culture. Never mind all those courses. If you want to learn a language and culture, go to the country and, and live there and learn those things. And then, you know, at the end of the day, when you, you'll be able to get translate, which is a real privilege. And by the way, I wanted to say to Sarah Kramer in particular, and Martin, who backed me up all along the way, um, that that team, the team, Abigail over there, Don, the team that brought this fantastic book out, really, really deserve um, huge congratulations. And Edwin Frank, my editor, he read the transcript of this on his phone upstate in somewhere in the first instance, and then offered me a contract um, in the fall. So the point I'm making there is that these guys, they're unbelievable. You know, I'm a working class, do you say working class here, or blue collar? Blue, working, working class, class yeah. Just an ordinary lad who happens to be a genius at particular things. And they only asked me two questions. They didn't ask me about questions of the British occupation of Ireland. Or they didn't ask me about anything. They just said, um, don't mention the war. They, they, uh, they just said two questions. Can you translate? And can you, can you translate well? And can you write well? And if you can do those two things, then you can translate. And that's the only two questions they asked me. So it was a fantastic experience for me to be able to produce this book uh, with New York Review Books Classics. Um, and you, I mean, you've done a superb job. The, um, the, I mean, the original Danish is, is incredibly lyrical. Again, as I said, in a slightly eccentric sense and, um, and you've captured it uh, beautifully and, and perfectly. Um, so thank you very much for listening to thank me. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.